ahead and get started. I'm going to, I've written up some problems rather vaguely, but anyways, here they are. Was it a Blackberry? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm glad to report that it was a Blackberry, not some other oddly shaped darkish color thing. <laughs> so, so last time we had left, uh, I talked about inductance and how we could sort of use that like we did with uh, Gauss's law. Remember, we used Gauss's law and V equals uh, negative integral E dot DL. We used Gauss's law to find the electric field of highly symmetric situations. Then we'd find uh, use V equals negative integral E dot DL to calculate the voltage between one part of it to another part. And then we find... <laughs> And then we'd uh, use C equals Q over V to find the capacitance of that little structure. Well, now we can use Ampere's law to find the magnetic field. Then we can use the definition, uh, or excuse me, then we can use flux equals integral of B dot DA to find the magnetic flux. And then we can use L equals N phi over I to calculate the inductance. And that's a very similar series. Uh, so those are very much uh, analogs to one another. And they're sort of the bare minimums you're supposed to get out of this second semester in electricity and magnetism, in including you know things like wave equations and all that good stuff. So here we're going to do that. We're going to calculate the inductance, also called self-inductance, of a long solenoid that has N turns, is tightly wrapped, has a length L and a cr uh, circular cross-sectional area of radius a, uh, radius R. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's go ahead. I've, I've written down, or I know all the things in top of my, off the top of my head, so I should be able to write them down in real time. What I know is L, the self-inductance, is equal to N times the magnetic flux over I. And that's just basically, I'll try to find the equation number for you guys so we can make sure we're uh, that was equation 30-4, which I, I did by analogy with the, well, Jesus, you aren't even looking at my document. You're looking at my bald head. <laughs> okay, so that was equation 30-4, which I made by analogy with comparing it to the mutual inductance, which is what we talked about last time. Uh, again, that last time mutual inductance thing, there's an example like 30-1, uh, and 30 dash two, and that's pretty much all I'll ever ask you about mutual inductance. So if you can do those, if you can understand those, you're good to go. So now we're gonna use this. And what we have is a solenoid. So I will recall, let you recall that a solenoid is like a bar magnet without the bar. So that's what we mean when we're talking about a solenoid, and dot, 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 and then I'll do G, G, G like that. Do the same thing here. And what we're doing is we're saying it is basically very long compared to the radius, which is quite small. Okay. And what I'm seeing on these little circles is basically the ends of the wires. So up here, this is say the current going into the page, or excuse me, coming out of the page, because we're looking at the points of the tips of arrows. And down here, there are little X's, meaning the current is going into the page. And from that, we should be able to figure out using uh, Ampere's law what the magnetic field is inside. Of course, in your, pro in your book, when they do problems like this, they're just assuming you recall the results from last time. And I try to use this as another opportunity uh, to remind you uh, how to use Ampere's law. So we can see that the current is actually going in, looping around, and then coming back out the top, and then, of course, going down like this. So if I were to grab one of these wires with my right hand, with my thumb pointing in the direction of current, I would see that my fingers pass through this way. Therefore, I expect the magnetic field to be right along the center, very, very intense and uniform. That's sort of the beauty of the solenoid is it makes a very, very intense magnetic field that acts radially along the solenoid. Okay, now near these edges, it's gonna do all sorts of crazy stuff, but that's fine because as long as we're examining areas near the center or not at least far from the edge, then it shouldn't be a problem. But basically that's what the fields look like.
Okay. What we have is Ampere's law, which says the closed integral of B dot DL is equal to mu zero I enclosed. So this is just like Gauss's law, which is a closed integral E dot dA, which was equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So you see that uh, uh, one over mu zero and epsilon zero are on the, are sort of similar. So I'll put them like equivalent, but leading to, that's just something to keep in mind. Mu zero and epsilon zero sort of have a re reciprocal light relationship conceptually, okay? Meaning, if I see some formula that has epsilon zero in it, there's some chance that I'll find a formula regarding magnetic fields that'll have the inverse of mu zero on it if it's got the epsilon zero in the electric field. So that's just something to keep in mind. And you can see that because in the case of uh, Gauss's law, it was Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So one over epsilon was sort of equivalent to mu, uh, mu zero. Now with this, what we're gonna do is imagine a Gaussian, uh, or excuse me, an Amperian loop. That Amperian loop, we're going to choose near the middle. And I'm going to choose a rectangular loop. And I'm going to choose it so that it goes basically the same direction as the magnetic field along there. Of course, perpendicular to the magnetic field here, opposite to the magnetic field, which actually is parallel to the magnetic field out here. But out here, the magnetic field is so small compared to this huge one that it's essentially zero. And then of course, this one's again, perpendicular to the magnetic field, okay? So we're saying, according to uh, the original problem, we're saying that the total number of turns in this thing, which has a length L, the total number of turns is big N. Okay, so what that means is if you wanted the turns per unit length, you just divide big N by a little L, and that would give you the number of turns per unit length. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this little length right here, since it's an Amperian loop, I'm going to call it L sub A. Uh, actually, I'll call it script L sub A, so we won't confuse it with, a, uh, <laughs> with the actual inductance. Okay. It turns out these dimensions right here are not going to matter too much, as you'll see in a second. So now I'm going to take the left-hand side of Ampere's law, the closed integral of b dot dl. That's going to be the integral of b uh, n dot dl. So I'm talking about the magnetic field inside, plus the integral of b dot dl where dl is going down so that's this side plus the integral of b dot dl uh i want to call this uh outside so we're talking about this part here plus the integral b dot dl and this one i'm going to say up for d or u for up and that's the four parts of the closed integral so the left-hand side, if you'll notice here, I'm going to call, if I just make my x-axis this way and my y-axis this way, then the first integral would be b equals b of r, where r is the distance, say, from the center line of uh, our b of r times i-hat dotted with dl, which dl is going to be dx i hat as well. So that's the first integral. Plus, in this b part, uh, the second term, part of it's going to be inside. So there's a significant magnetic field. And then out here, there's almost no magnetic field, at least relatively speaking. So basically, that's going to break up into two integrals, integral of b n uh, of r i hat dot, uh, let's say negative dy j hat plus integral zero dl, okay? So this integral zero, which I made really, really small, there you go, that integral zero dl is just because the magnetic field from about here out 
is zero. So this one is actually representing, or these two are actually representing this one integral, okay? So I think you can tell because I dat J is gonna give me zero and this is a magnetic field of zero. This whole term is gonna be zero, which means that term zero. So I'll just say equals zero, which means this one equals zero. And then the other one uh, out here, we have the integral of zero dotted with DL again, which is also zero. So I'm gonna call this one the same as this one. And we're gonna say, in fact, that it equals zero. So this one equals zero. <clears throat> and then the upside, we're gonna do plus the integral of zero DL again, plus the integral of BN of R I hat dot dx, or excuse me, dy j hat. So uh, this one, on the other hand, turns out to be these, these two, uh, excuse me, these two turn out to be this one integral. And I think you can see that just like before, this all equals zero as well. So this one also equals zero. It equals zero because this part is perpendicular, uh, but potentially non-zero integrand. This one has a zero integrand for this portion right here. Does that make sense to everyone? All right, yeah. so the only integral that survives is this guy right here, and that becomes just B of r times the integral dx, which is uh, basically x from x equals zero to x equals la. So that's b, L time, or b of r times la. So that's the left-hand side of Ampere's law, OK? Now, all this stuff, you don't have to write out. I mean, you need to understand that that's what's going on so that it makes sense that this is the answer. Because if you don't understand that, you won't be able to quickly write the shortened version of the answer. But once you get to that, you don't need to waste all your time on your test to show this. If you were doing a homework, I would like you to show it. But if, uh, you know, in turning it in, I would like you to show it. But in terms of a actual test, don't waste your time. Just figure out what the right answer is, put that down and keep going. So no one has any questions, right? Okay, we'll go on. Now the uh, right-hand side of Gauss's law is, or uh, Gauss's law, the right-hand side of Ampere's law becomes, right-hand side is mu zero times I enclosed. And I think you see that basically all the currents enclosed, notice they're going this way. So if I turn my right hand this way, as the currents are going in, or excuse me, if I grab uh, the currents as they're going in with my thumb pointing this way, sorry, I was getting confused for a second there. My thumb goes down in the direction of currents here. So my fingers are going this way. That means if the magnetic field's going this way, then these currents are going in the positive direction. So I'm happy with that. That means the right hand side is gonna be positive. And that right hand side, in fact, will be mu zero, times the number of char of currents per unit length, which we call lowercase n, times the length, which is LA. Okay. Now remember, I'll write this in a black pen. Lowercase n is defined to be n over L. Now I set right-hand side and left-hand side equal to each other. And when I do that, I get B of R, LA is equal to mu zero N times LA, time, oh, I left off the I, times the I. Remember, this is the total number of currents and that's the current. So in order to have a current, you have to multiply the current times the number of currents, or you're not going to have something with the units of current. So I have an I there. 
Now, because of that, you can see that the LA, the length of the ampere and loop canceled out. And lo and behold, I've got B actually is equal to mu zero N times I in the I hat direction. That's our magnetic field, okay? Now, we did use the fact that the radius of the sucker was R, uh, or we did say that anyways, we just haven't used it yet. That'll come in handy in a second when we're dealing with calculating the flux. Because first we had to calculate the magnetic field, now we've got to calculate the magnetic flux. So did everybody follow how we ended up getting mu zero N times I, and does everybody understand that lowercase n is just like lowercase u, it's the energy per unit volume. In the case of u, in the case of n, it's a uh, number of turns per unit length. So normally we take a small letter to represent the bigger letter divided by a quantity, okay? So no questions on that? All right, now we wanna calculate the flux. So flux is equal to the integral of B dot dA. Okay, in this case, the flux that we're talking about is the flux over this cross-sectional area, this, this circle that is perpendicular to the page. So it's like, it's a circle, but it's like this. Imagine just a penny standing up here on its side. Uh, the penny whose radius happens to be the radius of the solenoid, that would be the area through which the magnetic field is going. And in fact, you'd say, uh, B is equal to mu zero N I I hat dotted with, now in this case, we would say, uh, let's say, let's say we'll use circular uh, washers, I guess we could use a uh, little, little circles whose thickness are uh, two pi R dr. So, the differential radius element would be two pi r dr. And they're actually gonna point, we have a choice here as to whether they point to the right or the left. All they have to do is be perpendicular to dA. I'm gonna choose that they point in the same direction uh, as the B. So, and we're free to do that here. So I'll just say dot i hat. And we're gonna integrate that from r equals zero to big R, okay? And we might even say r is equal, or pi r squared, which we know that's what it's going to come out to, is actually equal to some area A. Then we could talk about the flux as just B times A. But either way, I think you see what's going to happen. I get mu zero in I all coming out. The I hat dot I hat becomes one. Uh, the two pi comes out and we get the integral of r dr. The integral of r dr from zero to r is just one half r squared, so the two pi times one half r squared becomes pi r squared. So I get mu zero n i times pi r squared is the magnetic flux. So there's another part we needed. Now, ultimately what we're trying to get is the self-inductance L, which is also just called the plane inductance, and L is equal to N magnetic flux over the current I. So now what we're going to do is we're going to plug in this. We'll say N is equal, to, or N is already there. Uh, over I, I'll put down here. And now I'm going to assess the current going through it. Now I'm going to take the magnetic flux, which I just did. And remember, I wasn't given N. I was only given big N and I was given little L. So I have to really produce it in terms of that. So I'm going to now take the 5B and write it as mu zero N over L, that's the N times I times pi R squared. And now you see that the I's cancel out. And you also see that the N's will square. So we've got the inductance is equal to mu zero N squared
over L times pi R squared. Okay. And in fact, more generally, anytime you have a solenoid, uh, L for a solenoid is equal to mu zero N squared. I feel like I left something off here. N squared mu zero. I think I got everything. Yeah, that's right. Uh, A over, oh, and I used a lowercase L for that, not an uppercase L. That would have been bad. So that's the ultimate inductance. The units of inductance, of course, being the Henry, but more common units are the micro Henry, uh, the milli Henry, the nano Henry, and so on and so forth. Any questions on that? Now I'm trying to decide if you see if your book has that listed as a as an equation for a solenoid. That would be in chapter 29. Let me double check this real quick to see. Actually, no, it wouldn't be in 29. Uh, yeah, it would just be here. And I don't see it labeled or numbered, so that's not one you're allowed to actually use. So you have to actually derive that if you need it in tests. All right, any questions about that? So you see this problem is sort of like a, what we call a capstone type of problem. Just like the same one where I take Gauss's law, uh, make you calculate electric field, take B equals negative integral E dot DL, make you calculate the voltage between the two plates, say uh, one positive, one negative, and then make C equal Q over V, uh, make you use that to calculate the capacitance. That's a capstone problem for a, for a big section of problems. This is a capstone problem for another big section of problems. So you can be uh, quite certain that come uh, midterm, or excuse me, some final exam, that you're expected to go through this whole process with various shapes for an inductor and this whole process with various shapes, of course, for a capacitor. So make sure you can do that. That is uh, from the electricity and magnetism portion of the course. That's probably the single two most important things you can do. Now let's stop sharing the screen for a second and go back to, or should be sharing the uh, camera view and uh, document view and go back to the sharing screen. So we just did number one. Now we want to calculate the inductance of two long, thin, concentric, uh, concentric cylindrical shells with current passing in opposite directions uh, in each part. So that's a pretty sparsely worded uh, problem there. It's pretty straightforward when I actually draw the diagram. Uh, so what I want to do is now I'm going to draw the diagram of what we're talking about. Uh, when you hear the word concentric and cylindrical, you should probably always just go ahead and think that we're talking about coaxial cable. And that's pretty much what we're talking about. Okay. So what we have here is basically, let's say we have a thin metallic cylindrical shell. And the reason we're doing this as a thin metallic cylindrical shell is because if you had this metal and it wasn't thin and metallic, it could actually have magnetic fields inside of it. And that makes a lot of things complicated, okay? But by using thin shells, any magnetism that goes on has to be very minor. So we can do it that way. Uh, that's gonna be, of course, surrounded by another thin concentrical sh uh, cylindrical shell, concentric cylindrical shell like this, and that's the actual coaxial cable that we're talking about, okay? Let's say this radius right here is big R1, and let's say this radius right here is big R2, okay? And let's once more actually argue that, uh, let's see, I think I want to make, I'm going to make the current coming out of this inner one this way. So you see currents coming out of the cylinder this way. And in fact, it's going in through that part of the cylinder. Okay. 
that's the typical scenario for coaxial cable is currents going one way in the central part and another way on the outside part. And if you open up your coaxial cable that, for instance, is being used for your dish network, direct TV or, or cable television, you'll see that the inner part has like a, a little copper wire and then the outer part has some braided aluminum wire. And that's basically the aluminum braid is the actual wire. And then there's all sorts of what we call dielectrics, which really just means uh, insulators, okay? So that's the problem we're working now. We're gonna try to do the same thing we did before. Uh, what I'm going to do is assume, for instance, uh, that let's say this is my x-axis. It's lying in the plane of the end. This is my y-axis. It's also lying in the plane of the end. And then my z-axis goes right along i. So that's x, that's y. And the reason I'm doing that is because now I can use my nice little cylindrical coordinate things again. I'm going to make the hypothesis that b is equal to some b of r in the uh, theta hat direction, where theta hat, of course, is the typical theta that measures counterclockwise from the positive y-axis being 90 or pi over two at the y-axis, 180 or pi at the negative x-axis, so on and so forth. And the phi hat, of course, points in the direction of increasing that, okay? Then I can say, uh, knowing Ampere's law, that DL is gonna be R d theta, theta hat. And I'm gonna attack it as the left-hand side of Ampere's law, closed integral B dot DL, and we're talking basically from R1 to R2 is all we care about because really what I'm trying to compute is the magnetic field between these two. And then I'm gonna take the magnetic flux through this little rectangular cross section to get the magnetic flux there. And then of course, to get the uh, inductance. So this is just going to become the integral of B of R theta hat dotted with R D theta theta hat, of course, theta hat dot theta hat equals one. Uh, the B of R and R comes out in front. So I'll say B of R times R times the integral of D theta from zero to two pi. So you get the typical B of R times two pi R, uh, where R is in between R1 and R2. Okay, there's supposed to be an equals here. I didn't write it. Now the right hand side, the right hand side is just gonna be mu zero I enclosed, which I think you can clearly see that the enclosed current inside of an Amperian loop, which I didn't actually draw, but I, I figured y'all had enough experience to know this was the actual Amperian loop I'm using. It's a little circle in the xy plane like this of radius r. So that's the radius r of that little loop. I'm actually integrating around in this direction, which is the same direction as the magnetic field. And of course, uh, when I grab that Amperian loop with my right hand and my thumb going around the circle, my fingers do point in the direction of the current. So I know that i is in fact uh, the positive direction. So from that, I can now say mu zero I enclosed is just going to be mu zero I. That means left hand side equals right hand side gives me B of R times two pi R is equal to mu zero I. So B is equal to mu zero I over two pi R in the bottom theta hat. So that's our magnetic field. Notice it goes around the coaxial cable uh, through there. What I'm gonna take for a uh, DA or for a total area A, I will use this orange thing. And I'm gonna say basically, this is my rectangular area A. So you can see it's basically R2 minus R1 is this height. 
this is some length L and I'm gonna do phi is equal to integral of B dot DA over that surface. So the magnetic flux is equal to integral of B dot DA, which is obviously mu zero I over two pi times the integral one over R theta hat dotted with now this direction what we want is we want a magnetic field to be uh, uniform or essentially constant over the DA so I got to choose really wisely what the DA is so the DA I'm going to choose is just this length times this height which is DR so this little height right here would be DR and this length right here would be say L so I'm going to say that also points in the theta hat direction. So I'll call this dot uh, L D R theta hat. So I think you can see that the L of course is going to come out front. Then the theta hat dot theta hat is just going to want be one, and I'll get the integral of dr over r. So uh, the integral of dr over r is just ln. So I end up getting this is equal to mu zero I over two pi times the natural log of, now uh, I'm gonna go from R1 to R2, or excuse me, yeah, from R1 to R2. So it'll be R2 over R1. That's my flux. I got it in a small part of the paper, so I'm gonna bring it up closer for you all to see it. And I'll try to make it a better focus when I get it here. So we're up to the flux part. Now I just need to multiply that by N and divide it by I. And there is no N, there's only one turn. So it's really just uh, dividing it by I. So you can see that it's gonna become mu zero over two pi. That's why, I, because of that short example, that's why I didn't take time to create a whole nother page. So the L, I will write in bright orange letters, L should just be equal to mu zero uh, L over, over two pi. Did I drop my L? Yeah, I did. My L disappeared here. When I divide that by, whoa, Nelly. That focus got really bad when I put it back down, didn't it? Okay, so there, there's the L there that was right there. Still not a great focus them. There you go. So this L is now mu zero L over two pi times the ln of R2 over R1. And that's the total answer. That's it. Okay. Now, when you actually buy coaxial cable, uh, they'll market it as a certain inductance per unit length. So really what they're selling you is Henry's per meter and this L will be over here. That's L over, that's inductance per, per unit length when you divide the L out. So you could actually do that, but that is actually the inductance. Again, I'll show it to you up close. Again, I'll focus it for up close. And I think you can see uh, where everything came from. That is the inductance of a coaxial cable. And that is the process, again, by which we go about uh, finding the inductance for certain symmetries. Remember, just like Gauss's law, which had very specific symmetries, Gauss's law is Gauss's law. It's not only true in certain symmetry cases, but if we want to use it to solve for the electric field, which is actually embedded in an integral and inside of a surface integral, we can only do use it that way when we're solving for certain symmetries in the uh, that exists. So in fact, it only has to be like infinitely large planes we can do for uh, Gauss's law, uh, infinitely long cylinders we can do for Gauss's law and spherical uh, shapes we can do for Gauss's law. Similarly for Ampere's law, we can do solenoids, we can do coaxial cables and we can do toroids quite easily with Ampere's law. Uh, that doesn't mean Ampere's law is only true in those cases. It just means Ampere's law can't be used to solve for the B inside of that nasty integral unless those symmetries are there. Any questions on that? 
to remember this is sort of the holy grail uh, these last two to three chapters and the other holy grail was the capacitance calculations done with Gauss's law. Uh, so make sure you, you know, bare minimum, you need to be able to do those come final exam time. Obviously next test as well. Uh, oh, I have another question. So let's go ahead and uh, share my screen again to see their next question. So the next question is say, determine the direction of the EMF induced A when the current through a solenoid is increasing and B when it is decreasing. So that's a kind of a neat little problem. Uh, I should have numbered these. So I'm gonna call this number one. I'm gonna call this little guy down here, number two. And now I'm doing number three. And what we mean by number three is we have a solenoid. So a wire comes in, goes like this. Okay, that's a solenoid. Okay, hold on. Y'all see what I'm talking about here, but anyways, let me go back and stop sharing. So that's supposed to be our solenoid. And I'm gonna say the current is going through it, let's say this way. And let's say I is increasing. Induced EMF. Is question mark. Now, I'm not actually asking you calculate the induced EMF, which we can. It's negative L D I D T. Uh, and that's basically it. But uh, the main thing is can we use Lenz's law to tell us in which direction the induced EMF will point? In other words, which direction will a current flow that has been induced by Lenz's law? So we've got a current carrying wire that's going around this way. I think you can see from that, that should create a magnetic field. Should that magnetic field point along the center this way? Or should it point along the center this way when current's actually going through the wire that way? Anyone? Should the magnetic field point through the center to the right or to the left? Somebody can do this, come on now. Remember this wire comes out in front of the page and then goes back behind the page and then comes out in front of the page and then back behind the page. So you can actually grab it as a three dimensional shape with your right hand and using your thumb to point in the direction of the current. So should the magnetic field point to the right or to the left? Would it be the right? Yes, it would be the right. So I'm going to draw it this way. So you can sort of get that it's not going in front of those wires there. So that's the direction of magnetic field. So according to Lenz's law, Lenz's law says an induced EMF will be created to oppose the changing of the flux. If the wire, if the current in the wire is increasing, the flux must be what? Increasing or decreasing? So the current increasing. in the increasing, exactly. So it will induce an EMF to try to decrease the flux. It does that by creating a magnetic field pointing the opposite way. If you're trying to decrease the flux, you create a magnetic field in the opposite way and you see which direction the current must go to do that. Well, to create a magnetic field in the opposite way, the current must be going this way around that loop, which means the EMF has a positive side here and a negative side here for EMF induced. So what you see is it's a back EMF. So as you're trying to jam the current higher and higher and higher, the back EMF is gonna to try to fight that and, and make it not rise as quickly as, as you would maybe want it to. So that's part A. Does everybody understand that? 
So the answer is create a back EMF. And that just means it's fighting whatever EMF you're producing, it's fighting it. We'll see that in a second. Uh, now let's look at part B. And part B is the same scenario, except now the current is decreasing. So uh, the current's still going to the right. So which direction is the magnetic field pointing? Right. Yes, so the magnetic field is still going to the right. And uh, is the magnetic flux increasing or decreasing? Decreasing. It's decreasing. So Lenz's law says a magnetic field will be uh, created in pointing in which direction? To the right or to the left? To the right. To the right, exactly. So uh, that means in order for it to go to the right, the current must go this way. So in fact, in this case, we're going to get a positive E induced and a negative E induced this way. So I is decreasing and then E induced was what we were asked and what we said is uh, it creates another back EMF. So as the EMF was trying to actually decrease, uh, it tried to reinstall it. And therefore it again is a back EMF. It's not allowing you to lower the current as quickly as you would like. It's gonna hold on to the current for as long as it can. So I will also include in this uh, I induced would point this way. And in this case, I induced would point that way. So that's why I was trying to say about writing the positive EMF induced over here and the negative here because uh, conventional current flows from positive to negative. Conventional current flows from positive to negative. I think everybody follows that. Anybody have any questions on that one? Okay. So what we're gonna try next, let me uh, share my screen again, look at the problem again. What we're gonna do now, we'll say got about 25 minutes left, uh, is calculate the energy stored in an inductance L and compare it to the energy stored in a capacitance. So uh, this is a pretty straightforward, i.e. typical problem. Uh, we know, for instance, that power is equal to IV, remember P equals IV, well, let me go ahead and again, stop sharing, show you my document cam. Remember P equals IV, that's one of our fundamental equations that you should have committed to memory just from using it so much. Uh, but in this case, we're gonna write it as P equals I times E, meaning EMF. And that's only because we realize uh, that the EMF is L D I D T. So I'll write this as I, times L D I D T. And we already had uh, found that earlier, basically when we were doing the inductance, that was equation 30-5. Uh, and it came originally, I guess you could look at it from uh, the original mutual inductance where E is equal to D phi D T, but of course phi was dependent on the B, which actually was dependent on the current. So that L D I D T is where the uh, is where this came from. So this part right here is the in current uh, the current or excuse me the EMF across an inductor. L D I D T or negative L D I D T, depending on whether it's a decrease in voltage or increase in voltage. Uh, now that we have that, we can actually use that to help us calculate. Uh, energy. So energy, of course, P is equal to dW dt. So we can write dW is equal to P dt. But P, as we just found it, was in fact I 
L di dt, of course, times dt, because the dt was already there from this dt. So we can say that work is sort of the integral of dw, even though it's not technically correct to say that. This is not a something, this is not a, a differential that you could actually integrate. Uh, in other words, work depends on path. So you can't just blindly say the integral of dw is w. Uh, but I'll just say work is equal to the integral of PDT. And that's the same as the energy. So PDT is going to become the integral of I times L times DI, uh, which is actually equal to the energy U. So U, if we actually integrate this, I think you can see the L will come out front and I just get the integral of IDI, which is one half I squared. So I'm going to say one half uh, L I squared. So that's one half L I squared is the energy. Now uh, that's of an inductor. Notice that looks a lot like U is equal to one half C V squared. And this is the other part of the question that I told you. I wanted you to compare it to what we got for a capacitor. So it's sort of the same uh, formula where capacitance plays the role of inductance, but here's the weird part. Uh, the voltage plays the role of current, or in the case of the capacitance, what was voltage is now current in the case of the inductance. So the inductance sort of has the current is more important to it, whereas the uh, capacitance has that the voltage is more important to it. With that in mind, now we can go ahead and compute it for a typical scenario. So for instance, let's consider the case where we have a solenoid. So if I have a solenoid, then I could say one half times I squared. Now I'm going to put the formula for the solenoid, which I think you just recall was mu zero n squared A over L. That's why I put the A in mu zero n squared times a over l and i think i used the lowercase l yeah did i use the lowercase l on that okay so uh that is actually the total current sort of stored in the magnetic field inside of a solenoid and we can use that now to compute uh what the actual energy is in terms of say area and volume. I want this, but I want this without the current. So I've got to uh, write a relationship involving uh, the current that I can replace the current with. So I'm going to write one half times mu zero n squared a over L. And now I've got to use the fact that uh, I is actually V times L times mu zero uh, or over mu zero N to compute the actual uh, current. So basically remember what we found was uh, B for the solenoid was mu zero uh, N squared over L. So we can actually say the I can be given by this, which is BL over mu zero in and all that will be squared and now you'll get some nice uh cancellations because you can see this l squared is going to cancel out with one of the l's down here uh the n is going to cancel out with the two n's up here the mu zero is going to cancel out except i got a mu zero squared over here so ultimately i'm going to have a b squared over two mu zero times a times l well if you take the cross-sectional area of a solenoid and you multiply it by the solenoid's length then you have the volume so we can say lower case u which is u per unit volume is equal to b squared over two mu zero and that's really the result we were shooting for. Uh, this looks just like the formula we got for the capacitor, which again, if you want to do the capacitor, you'd say one half the capacitance uh, for a capacitor is epsilon zero 
uh, A over D. And then, of course, the uh, voltage was Q over C, which would be Q over uh, Q over epsilon zero A over D. So uh, we could say V is equal, well, C equals Q over V. So V is equal to Q over C. Yeah, I was doing that right. So this is going to be Q over epsilon zero A over D. That'll be squared. When I get this con uh, basically worked out, I get one half epsilon zero A over D times Q squared D squared over epsilon zero squared A. Now you can see a bunch of stuff cancels out just like happened before. And now I got Q squared over two epsilon zero. So notice this is the charge squared over two times that constant. And like I told you before, uh, often the epsilon, oh, I put the epsilon zero in the wrong place, didn't I? The epsilon zero, I think the epsilon zero, well, let's work it out. The epsilon zero, no, I, I got it right. It's actually epsilon zero is in the bottom. So we ultimately got this epsilon zero cancel out with a two down here. Uh, the A and the D exist as well. So I have A times D. So again, you get in this case, lowercase u, which is big U over the volume is equal to Q squared over two epsilon naught. That's the big energy concerns I was trying to show you. Uh, basically, in an inductor, the energy stored in a magnetic field. In a capacitor, the energy stored in an uh, electric field. And in fact, those two are related. The total energy would be the sum of these two if you have an electric and magnetic field. And though I derived them specifically for a solenoid and a capacitor, these results are actually the true ones. Even though I just used it as a one-time instance to find out what it would be for that one-time solenoid or that one-time capacitor, parallel plate capacitor, it gives me the right expression that I know from a, a deeper, higher theory. And that's the main thing that I wanted you guys to get is uh, basically this uh, energy density is proportional to the square of the field. It's proportional to B squared, it's proportional to Q squared, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, and actually I should, that's what I'm doing. That's, what, that's why I have the epsilon zeros in the bottom. I should have left this in terms of uh, E because E, <laughs> that's what I did. I, I ended up uh, getting rid of the V in terms of Q, but I should have gotten the V in terms of E. Let me go ahead and finish that just to, to make that right. Remember for a, a capacitor, we had uh, V is equal to E times D. That's what I should have put here. So when I do that, I could say uh, U is equal to one half epsilon zero A over D, that's C. And then V is equal to E squared D squared. Uh, so that's the V. Now you can see what happens is I get uh, epsilon zero E squared over two. Now this is times A times D because one of these will cancel out there. So that U, and this is really the expression I was trying to go for, U is equal to big U over V, which is equal to epsilon zero E squared over two. So that's really what I was saying. I, as you could probably sense that I was hemming and hauling, trying to figure something out. And uh, the reason was because, remember, I just finished telling you earlier that epsilon zero plays the role of one over mu zero. And it was refuting that. And then I remember why I, I was using charge instead of the electric field. Uh, but anyways, once I got that straight, now you see uh, it, the epsilon zero does have a reciprocal relationship with the mu zero. You still have the one half and the field squared. So the square of the uh, field is proportional to the energy density. That's the main result I wanted to get. Sorry about that, folks. Uh, this is everything I did here was right. It's just in terms of Q, which doesn't help us any. That uh, does help us any when, uh, some when we're talking about the actual circuits. So you can talk about the total energy in terms of the uh, charge maybe that a capacitor had on it initially, or you can talk about it for the current that was originally going through an inductor. Uh, when we talk about LC, LR, and LRC circuits, uh, that'll come in handy. So any questions on 
those main two results, which are the most important ones. <laughs> okay. And hopefully I'll see the parallel between this and that. And just like we've been seeing the parallels for electric dipoles and uh, magnetic dipoles, the torque on a magnetic dipole, the torque on electric dipole, uh, the potential energy of electric dipole, the potential energy of a magnetic dipole, all of these are simply analogous formulas. And that is the beauty of Maxwell's equations where it shows you that mag the magnetic field and the electric field are just two sides of the same coin. And ultimately relativity proves that. In fact, it's kind of amazing, which is why Einstein called his paper on the electrodynamics of, of, uh, of materials, basically. I think it was something like that, but it had the electrodynamics in the title. And that was because basically Maxwell's equations were already correct, correct with regards to relativity, whereas you know F equals M A didn't uh, wasn't correct with relativity. Quantum mechanics also, when it came out, was not correct with relativity until Dirac fixed it. So uh, the next part is LR circuits. I want to show you a, a quick derivation or two, and that'll be pretty much it because we only got two uh, or excuse me about 12, 11 minutes left. So let's imagine a circuit where you have basically a battery, a voltage V0. It's going to go off to a switch. And that switch can allow electricity to go uh, one way or another, basically. So the switch can go like this. It can swing through either one of these. And then go around here to basically a resistance R, or of course a resistance R and an inductor L. And of course that is actually the the current or the electronic sig uh, symbol for an inductor is this little coil of wire and you now see why because clearly a, a solenoid is shaped like that and a lot of inductors if you actually purchase an inductor uh say from what used to be radio shack i think it's the radio shack's just now coming back out you'll see it literally as a solenoid or in some cases you'll see an actual toroid so that's kind of neat but if we use ampere's law or excuse me uh kirchhoff's law of uh circuits basically says the sum of the voltage drops and increases in any closed circuit is equal to zero, you get that V0. So I go from here to here. I'm assuming the switch is this way, right? And then I get to here and I say, oh, well, this is minus I times R, okay? And then I get to this and say, oh, well, this is minus L D I D T. So that's the uh, voltage drop for that. Well, now I'm back to where I started from. So I'm going to set that equal to zero. That's all well and good. And turns out that I can uh, manipulate this a little bit and say L D I D T uh, plus I R is equal to V zero. I can subtract I R from both sides. I'll say L D I D T is equal to V0 minus IR. Now I've got a function V0 and R are constants, but the I is a variable. So I can separate this and say DI over V0 minus IR is equal to DT over L. Now I can integrate that and I'm gonna integrate it from I equals, in this case, we're actually gonna go from T equals zero, I equals zero to I of T. And in this case, I'm gonna integrate from T equals zero to time T. Uh, we're basically doing a substitution here. We'll say, let U equal V zero minus I R so that du is equal to negative uh, i, or excuse me, uh, negative r di. So uh, we have di, that means di is actually equal to negative uh, du over r. So now I can take this and say, well, di is gonna be replaced with negative du over r. So I'll say negative one over R times the integral of DU over U 
is equal to, obviously this part's easy peasy. This is just gonna become T over L. Uh, and then uh, this right hand, or this left hand side becomes the natural log. So I get negative one over R times the ln. Remember, we're going now from U equals uh, V zero to U equals V zero minus I technically of T times R, okay? I'll just call it I of R, but I wanted y'all to understand that's what's going on. So I'll get V zero minus I R over V zero. And that is equal to T over L. So I can multiply through by negative R I'd, I'd get ln of V zero minus I R over V zero is equal to uh, negative R over L times T. I'll raise E to the left-hand side power. I'll raise E to the right-hand side power. Again, doing the fast and loose way that we do in physics. And this start becomes V0 minus I R over V0 is equal to E to the negative R over L times T. Uh, that gives us, in fact, that uh, I'm solving ultimately for uh, really for I. So I'll multiply through by V0 and I'll get V0 minus I R is equal to V0 times E to the negative uh, T over tau, where tau is equal to L over R. You can do as an exercise, convince yourself that L over R has units of seconds. And that's really the time constant for a, a LR circuit. <clears throat> now with this, I'm still trying to solve for uh, I. So I'm going to pull this over there and this over there. So I ultimately get V0 times 1 minus E to the negative T over tau again. That's what happened when I pulled this. Over. Actually, should that be a plus? No, that'll be a minus over there. Yeah, and this is actually equal to I times R. So ultimately I can get I of T is equal to V zero over R times one minus E to the negative T over tau. This is the actual expression for the current going through a LR circuit. And what you'll notice is that T equals zero we get e to the negative zero, which is basically one over e to the or one over one. So this whole thing zero. And then as t approaches infinity, we get one over e to the infinity, which is zero. So it slowly approaches v zero over r, which gives us a graph that looks like this. I versus t goes you, and it's asymptotically approaching v0 over r and, and in fact one over or one minus one over e is 0.63 so it reaches about 63 63 percent of v0 over r uh within one time constant so if i come down here and write t is equal to l over r then what we'll know is that this goes up and comes over here and this will be 0 0.6 three V zero over R. So that's really what that uh, graph is supposed to be showing. Any questions on that? So this is an expression. Your book takes the time to number it. It's numbered 30 dash nine. So it is again, a equation that you can technically use. Uh, you don't have to derive it. In other words, if you can derive it, then I think you're, you know, much better off, but you don't have to. The main thing is now you can just use it to solve problems willy nilly. If you now try switching the, uh, switching the little switch, which was going from here to here, if now that this has a current going through it, if I take and switch this from the battery, guess what happens? It's kind of crazy, but because this, inductor doesn't readily lose its current because of that back EMF, it's going to sort of act like a power supply and it's slowly going to allow the current to drop as it goes through here. 
And that was the other part of the derivation I'll do. I think I'll try to do that really uh, sort of quickly. Your book has a derivation of it as well. So it's not that big of a deal uh, if you don't miss, if you don't get all the details, but I wanted you to at least hear uh, me explain it. So what we have right now is a current I zero going through it. And we're just gonna basically say this is the circuit. And what we mean by that is basically uh, starting here, which might have a voltage of zero, uh, doesn't really matter because Kirchhoff's law says it's gonna be zero by the time you get to the end anyways. I'm gonna say minus I times R minus L D I D T. Uh, all that's equal to zero. Uh, Grant, you can't see that. Minus I times R minus L D I D T. All that's equal to zero. You can't really see. Uh, you can't really see it, but basically what this is uh, saying is this is all the voltages, all the parts of the circuit that are causing a decrease in voltage. They're all decreases, but they should add up to give you zero. So I do that. Your book then, of course, puts everything on the other side. And if you start with this, it looks really confusing, but I think if you start with it that other way, it's still a little confusing, but not quite as bad. But this is a separable differential equation. We can write it as the integral of, of di over i. And we're gonna integrate that from i zero to i of t, which I think you can tell will be zero eventually. And that's going to be equal to, in this case, uh, negative integral R over L dt. And when we integrate those, we end up getting the ln of I over I zero is equal to negative R over L times T. This is again T over L over R or T over tau in other words. We can raise it to the E power and now we get finally I is equal to I zero times E to the negative T over tau where tau is again defined to be L over R. So that's exponential decay. When we actually make this graph as a function of time, it goes from I zero approaching zero. And in fact, it will reach a 37% uh, of I zero. in uh, L over R, because notice what happens when L over R occurs you have uh, T equals L over R divided by L over R, that's E to the negative one. E to the negative one is in fact 0.37. So you get 0.37 times I zero, and that is the exponential decay. But notice, you know, unlike a battery, if you disconnect the battery, the, the current drops off zero. This is not the case with a capacitor. And now we see it's also not the case with an inductor. So inductors and capacitors play similar roles, but they're slightly different. That's what the remaining parts of this chapter is from. This, by the way, is equa equation 30-11. So this is another one you're allowed to use to solve problems. So I'd suggest you look at uh, the examples in your book, which are uh, example 30-6. And uh, the LC circuit we'll do next time. And example 30-7, you can make sense of it using uh, the same stuff. And then example 30-8, you can start to see. But we're going to go ahead and finish up the chapter next time. We are done uh, for tonight just because we've run out of time. But like I said, I'm going to spend one more class day on this. And hopefully this will help you uh, better understand uh, how RC circuits or, or excuse me, how AC circuits work because we're going to actually work it out and we're going to find out uh, about Eli the Iceman, which means that the voltage leads the current in an inductor and uh, ice means the current leads the voltage in a capacitor. So that's Eli, E-L-I, E-M-F, inductor, current, ice, uh, current, uh, capacitor, E-M-F. Uh, we're going to learn why that's the case as well. So I think it gives you a good understanding of AC circuits and why we treat them the way we do. So I'm going to finish that. I'm going to probably, I'll probably skip resonance, uh, which is, and I'll probably skip three phase AC.
uh, but that's about it. Impedance matching, uh, which is uh, I'll definitely skip, and resonance I may skip because it's not much different from that. And three phase AC I've already talked about. That's what the power company sends you. Uh, your book does a good description of that. I would suggest you read it, especially if you're going into double E. Uh, but I'm not going to hold you to it. So you folks are free to go. I know uh, Dylan had a question for me related to my email that he sent me, but uh, anybody else has questions, please wait around. Otherwise, you're free to go. Have a good night. You too. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you, Professor. Have a good night. You too. Gotcha. Yeah, Dylan, I know what you're talking about. I just remembered to email. Yeah, I'll do that. And uh, you you should have until uh, probably Thursday, if that's OK. Yeah, that's perfect. It was a shit show of a day yesterday traveling back from <laughs> Iowa. And yeah, I feel, yeah. it, like I got stuck. We circled Charleston for about an hour <clears throat> and then they diverted us to Columbia, South Carolina.